الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمد الله سبحانه وتعالى ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وصرواته وسلم على رسول الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا أفضل خلق الله وعلى آله طيبين الأطهار وصحابته الأبرار ومن تبعهم بأحسان إلى يوم الدين In the program, uh, this topic is uh, how to become a better human being, and it has a period, and I was thinking about uh, myself talking about that, and I think I'd rather put a question mark uh, at the end instead of a period, uh, because I think I'm going to ask more questions, I think, than uh, maybe perhaps provide answers. Um, but one thing that we should note is that the Quran is a book that contains uh, quite a few questions. It's a book that, in fact, demands that human beings think because the nature of a question is to open the mind to reflection. So questions are an important aspect of the human uh, nature and the human condition. And, and one of the questions that should come to mind is, what is a human being? We should all ask this question. Uh, some of them would contend that uh, a human being is more akin to the, uh, the phoenix of the West or the unicorn, uh, a legendary creature that uh, is talked about but actually never seen. The Qur'an, uh, in fact, would contest that view and indicates in the Qur'an that, in fact, there are human beings. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he gives one of the reasons why he created the human being in the first place, when he says, khalifa, that I'm going to place in the earth a khalifa, and this istikhlaf, is considered one of the reasons why the human being was created in the first place. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would uh, put in the earth the one who would be a caretaker over the earth. Now the angels, because they had seen, according to uh, Imam al-Razi, Fakhreddin al-Razi, they had seen what the jinn had done when they were on the earth, because the presence of the jinn on the earth preceded the presence of the human beings. Uh, they... Uh, they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are you going to put one in the earth that uh, فيها, that will sow corruption, الدِّمَاء, and they will shed blood. Uh, and the angels, in fact, were saying that it's more proper that we should be put onto the earth as a khalifa because we'll do a better job than these human beings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said something uh, that all of us should ponder, uh, I know what you don't know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he said this, I know what you don't know, he was indicating that there was an element to the human nature uh, that was hidden from the exterior appearance of the human nature. And this is the element of the ukhrawi element, or the otherworldly element, the angelic element, because it is uniquely man's position in the earth uh, that he was created as an interspace between the two worlds. In other words, the, it is the angelic realm that is made for the malal al-a'la, or the, uh, the highest place, the unseen world, the ghayb. They don't uh, disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and yet it is the human being that has the capacity to possess these two elements, which are called the nasha'atani. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an uh, about the first, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمَ النَّشْأَةِ الْأُولَى فَلَوْ لَا تَذَكَّرُونَ you understood the first nash'a, which is this nash'a that we're in now, this first creation. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in another place in the Qur'an, ثُمَّ اللَّهُ يُنْشِئُكُمْ نَشْأَةَ الْآخِرَةِ Then Allah will give you a second nash'a. So this human being has these two uh, creations. One is this worldly creation and the other is the next worldly creation, and it is the ruh and the body that have been united in this creature which is called Bani Adam or the insan, the human being. And this uniting of the two forces, these elemental forces, the higher and the lower, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in the human being the ability to be a, a control or a bridge between these two elements so that they function harmoniously and not antagonistically to one another. And that element is called the intellect. And so the, the human being is called, according to the Arab uh, scholars, the Muslim scholars, al-haywan al-natiq, 
the articulating animal. And this articulation is what distinguishes us from the rest of the animal kingdom and puts us into the angelic realm because the angels also have the capacity to articulate. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says, Ar-Rahman, uh, Allam al-Quran, khalaq al-insan, Allamahu al-bayan. The merciful who has revealed the Quran, has taught the Quran, created the human being and then given him the vehicle by which he can obtain the knowledge that is in the Quran. In other words, he gave him the intellect which will allow him to absorb the Quran because the Quran is an articulation. It's karam Allah. It is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this human being has the ability to understand speech. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken to the human being. Now, if you look at the, 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 the nature, our, our nature, this lower nature, which is filled with what's called hawa and shahawat. This is the passion and the shahawa. The shahwa is that thing which pulls us down. And hawa by its nature is a downward descent. Wanajmi idha hawa. By the star when it descends. So hawa is a movement down. It is a downward motion. And this is called darakat in the Quran. Darakat is the downward motion. And the fire is toward the downward motion. And this is metaphysics. I mean, the, we, don't, we can't look at these things quite literally. We're talking in the metaphysical world. There is a downward motion. And this is why they're in the lowest darak of the fire. Now, Jannah is darajat. And the duraj is, is a ladder which takes effort to climb up. Now, here already Allah is indicating in the vocabulary of the Quran that there is a dual tension. There is a dual nature here. One is an upward motion, which is the motion of the intellect, because the intellect is the highest point in the human being. Of, uh, uh, if you look at our organs, the highest organ is the intellect. The lowest organ is the farj, because everything below the, the private part is, there's already examples of it above the private part. In other words, just muscle, muscle and, uh, and uh, uh, bone and these things. So the lowest organ is the, the private part. Now, look at this private part. It's an amazing thing because we share it with the human being, uh, with the animal. The animals have this same organ. The animals can, uh, in fact, they're better at, if, if we think that that's somehow uniquely human, the animals are better at that than, than, the, than the human. I mean, a, a, a cock has uh, 40 uh, or 50 hens, you see. I mean, a human being can't, this is impossible. So the, the, the human being does not, we don't have a monopoly on that aspect of, of nature. You see, the, the other animals have it and they're better at it than the human being. And this is why people that take that as their deen, and there are people that take that as their deen because the Prophet ﷺ said, Mudminu zina ka'abidul wathan. The one addicted to fornication is like the worshiper of an idol. So there are people that they, they worship that. Now, what has Allah done just to remind us about the nature of that, that organ? He has put the covenant on that organ. We are circumcised to be a reminder throughout our lives that we have an oath with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will not become slaves to that lowest part of ourselves. We will not become slaves to that lower part of ourselves. It, there is a section of it that is cut off from the human being to indicate a purification from an obedience to the animal nature, the bestial nature of the human being. Now, this shaitan is literally, I mean, this is one of his uh, easiest inroads into the human being. One of his easy inroads is to deviate the human being through his shahwa, through his passion. So this shahwa that is moving down is literally obviated or, or blocked by this intellect that is moving up. Now, the intellect is given massive uh, faculties. I mean, if you look at the brain itself, it's estimated in the materialistic sciences that there are more, uh, that there are more brain cells than there are stars in the universe. Allah has given this, this human brain massive capacity. Uh, in most estimates, we're using less than 0.1% of our brain, the total brain mass, less than 0.1%. Uh, 
there are people that hydrocephalic people that are born with uh, water on the brain given less than 5% of the, of the total neocortex, which is the new brain mass, and yet they graduate from universities with honors. You see, I mean, this is, this is a fact of life. There are people that have less than 5% of our neocortex, the brain mass, and they do fine. You see, so the brain has massive potential, but that potential needs to be harnessed by the human being. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put within this brain, and this is what modern neuropsychological research is revealing, that the human brain has an extraordinary capacity towards self-deception. Now, in many ways, the self-deception is essential to being human. The first great self-deception is that you will not die. This is the first great self-deception of the brain, that the human being will not die. Now, this state of believing that you are immortal is important for the first phase of life. In other words, for the child to grow, for the child to experience the world, the child has to be, in a sense, fearless, intrepid. If the child realized how dangerous it was to get up in the morning and to walk around, it would stay in bed. But it doesn't. It realizes that it believes, in a self-deluded sense, that it is invulnerable. So what you will see with the child as it's coming into its body, it begins to be aware of its limitations, the body limitations. The child will touch fire and become burnt. And this is a lesson to the intellect. It's imprinted on the cellular level. The child will bruise itself and learn that falling, you see, because children at an early age, they'll jump off anything. But then they learn quickly that, no, there's limitations, that you can't do that. And so this is a movement from this deluded state of the brain that doesn't know limits into the state of understanding that there are human limits, that there are limits. Now, this is the first and this is the prerequisite to understanding the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because just as there are physical limits to the human being, there are also moral limits to the human being if they are transgressed then things will happen to them just as if those physical limits are transgressed, things will happen to them. This is the nature of the world that we're living in. It's a world of limitations. Now, one of the things you will note, which is a motif of the age that we're living in, is this idea of no limits. You see, they'll show a person on the top of Mount Everest and they'll, they'll have a, 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 a Nike commercial. Just do it. You know, in other words, go beyond the limits. Break the boundaries. And in fact, this is an ad campaign called Break the Boundaries. It's an ad campaign of one of these uh, sports uh, commercials. And this is the idea that, no, break those boundaries. You see, go on, do it. And this is exactly what Shaitan wants to do. He wants to fool you into breaking your physical limitations as well as your moral and spiritual limitations. And this is part of his game, to bring us down. To bring us down. Because Shaitan is down. And the amazing thing about it is what Shaitan complained about. He said, You created me from fire, which is high. It's a rising element. And you created him from mud and water, which is low. It's a lowering element. This is in the outward level. The inward level is the secret that things are lie hidden in their opposites. That by the fact that the human being is low and humbled, he's raised up high and exalted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man tawadahu lillah, rafa'ahu Allah. The one who is humiliated or abased for Allah's sake, Allah raises him up. And the one who, وَمَن تَكَبَّرَ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَضَعَهُ Allah. And the one who becomes arrogant and high and exalted, Allah will abase him in the earth. مَن تَجَبَّرَ قَصَمُهُ Allah. The one who becomes a tyrant or a, an oppressor, Allah will destroy him, will abase him. And this is the nature, this is the sunnah of Allah in his creation. Because Allah has sunan that are spiritual and moral just as there are sunan, there are physical laws. And this is part of understanding what we are as a human being. What is Bani Adam? Now if you look at this, uh, at the, more into this human nature, the human being has these two nasha, but then he has two other things which are called the sa'adatani, the two joys. The first joy is the joy of this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Udkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum. Remember my ni'mah that I have given you. And this is sa'ada in this world, that there is a type of joy in living in this world with the blessings that Allah bestows upon human beings. And the one who is in a reflective mode will recognize that no matter how difficult his life becomes, he's in ni'm. 
See, Allah says, when تعدوا نعم الله لا تحصوها. If you will begin to count the blessings of Allah, you will never reach its end. They are unlimited. Ibn Abbas said, any tribulation that you are in, it could be worse, and that in itself is a ni'mah that you should make gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. If you look at our uh, Bosnian brothers and sisters, that was a great tribulation that came upon those people. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought many of them back to the deen through that tribulation. They came back to the deen. They had to learn the prayer. You see, they had to learn the prayer. They haven't been praying for, for a long, long time. And they had to learn the prayer. Now, it was a, a majestic and powerful way of learning the prayer, but they learned the prayer. They went back to the prayer. And this is the nature of Allah's majesty because we are either witnessing the beauty of Allah or the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And both of them, dhul jalali wal ikram. These are both ni'mas. Allah's majesty and Allah's beauty. He's dhul jalali wal ikram. So the human being is the one that enters into the witnessing of Allah's majesty and his beauty. Either al-qabid or al-basil. And for the mu'min, he is the one that sees Allah in both states. The kafir and the munafiq only sees Allah in the state of, of, of beauty. They don't see Allah in the state of majesty. And this is why uh, either, either, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them things, you see, if Allah gives them things, they say, Rabbi Akramani, Allah loves me, God loves me. You see, we're number one. There's people who think that, God bless America. You know, because they have a lot of bounty. Well, Allah says, We will take them by degrees. What does that mean to be taken by degrees? It means that Allah will give people great gifts and they won't give gratitude to Allah and he'll increase them in his gifts. He will increase them in his gifts and they will become deluded. They will enter into a self-deluded state thinking that the increase in blessing is in fact a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves them. And all they're seeing is the, the, the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which hidden behind it is the majesty of Allah. He's the first and the last and he's the outwardly manifest and the inwardly hidden. So don't be deluded by the, the dual attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses. These attributes that appear on the outward to be opposites, when in fact they are one because Allah is one. And so we witness Allah because we're muwahidun. We say, la ilaha illallah, and we see the oneness of Allah in his majesty and his beauty. So the human being, this, this extraordinary creature, that if you look in, 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 uh, in the world right now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِي أَنْ خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ From his signs, he created you from dust. And then look, you're human beings, Bashar Tantashirun, you're everywhere spreading out in the earth. Now there are two types because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angelic uh, contention was that they will sow corruption in the earth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's contention was in the Alumala Ta'alamun. So from amongst these creatures, there are three. Uh, natures. There are three natures. From amongst the creatures, there are three natures. Thank you. The first nature is called nafs al lawama. The Bani Adam has three natures. The first nature is called uh, nafs al ammara. Afwa. Nafs al ammara. Inna nafsi la ammara tum bisu. My nafs commands to evil. This is the first nature of the human being. Now, if you watch the child after its beautiful state of fitrah, which is the, the first year of life, you will see absolute submission. Absolute and total submission. But as the child begins to enter into the egocentric stage, this, the stage of the nafs, al-ammara, where it only sees itself and it becomes the little emperor. And the parents are these servants. They become the slaves of the infant. When it enters into that stage, it only knows nafsi, nafsi. And what we have to teach it is, no, there's other people in the world beside you, little boy or little girl. This is what the parent has to impart to the child. And it's a difficult lesson, and many people fail to learn it. Many people will spend their entire lives in that infantile, egocentric stage in which they simply say, nafsi, nafsi. I'm all that exists, and the world is here to serve me. And this is a sick and diseased state. 
for the adult, for the child, it's a, it's a wonderful stage of life, you see. I mean, we laugh at it, and, and it's beautiful. We don't laugh at it when they're 30 years old and they're still doing the same game. But when they're little children, it, it's, it's cute, it's beautiful. Because they're غَيْرُ mukallaf. They have no taklif, they have no responsibility. And this is a stage that Allah has created in them for a wisdom, for a reason. So this nafs al-amara is this nafs that says, do it, do it. You see, do it for you. Do it for you. Now this, if you look, this is, this is shaitan's game again. And the modern world is the world of the self. Everything you see out you is calling to the self, whispering constantly, you're number one. You're the most important thing in the world. Go for all the gusto you can. You only go around once. You only live once. Get all you can. Do unto others before they do unto you. Right? This is Shaitan's, this is, this is his whispering into the hearts of human beings. If you don't get him, he's going to get you. And this is what the modern corporate mentality, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You see? And dogs, and this is what Sayyidina Isa in a Muslim tradition said, الدُّنْيَا جِيفَتُونَ وَأَهْلُهَا كِلَابٌ عَلَيْهَا The world is like a dead carcass and its people are like dogs around it. There was a, an advertisement that I saw in a magazine and it was an advertisement for learning how to become a more ruthless businessman. And it had a bunch of wolves. That was the advertisement. I mean, I'm not making this up. It had a bunch of wolves and it said, learn how to work in a pack. You see, in other words, as a corporate team, you can eat more people. And then it said, but good for lone wolves too. You see, so they're already telling you what they think of you. You're a predatory animal. You're a predatory animal. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an, a different picture of the human being. A, a different picture. I know what you don't know. So what is this thing that Allah knows that the angels didn't know? That the human being has a ruh, that he's a batani creature as well as a bahiri creature. That he's not simply body, that he's not simply hawa and shahawat, that he's not simply his passions and his bestial nature that calls him to sowing corruption in the earth, that he's not simply a nafs al-amara, he's a nafs al which is the next stage. Now, nafs al is where you move into a cognitive faculty that recognizes right from wrong. And this is part of the socialization that's needed from the parents and the society to teach the child. And you will find that societies are, are four in nature. Societies are four in nature. There are societies in which the parents and the society are conducive to the natural fitra of the child. And this is the ideal society, and this is what we call Medina al munawwara and any model that follows it after it, like the great Islam of Shaykh Uthman Dan Fodio in Africa, or the Islam of Amir Abdul Qadr al Jazairi, or the Islam of Salahuddin al Ayyubi, when there were just and rightly guided leaders, and the Prophet وسلم, said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his, his Sultan, the, the Sultan in the earth is Dillullah. That the just ruler is the shade of Allah in which the human creation takes shade from the sun of oppression, from the heat of oppression. And this is why the one who goes out on the authority of the Sultan has left the ripqa of Islam. He's outside of Islam. He's become a khariji. He's somebody that's rebelled against the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. So if you look then at this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this, this nafs al lawama this mechanism that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in the human being, it is the recognition of right and wrong. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there are some who khalatu amalan salihan wa akhara sayyia. They mix good actions with wrong actions. Asallahu an yatuba alayhim. But Allah will forgive them, will give tawbah to them if they make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are those who are in this middle stage. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the people who were given the book. فَمِنْهُمْ وَارِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ There are those who are oppressive to themselves. وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدْ And there are those who are in the middle. وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ 
And there are those who outstrippers in good by the permission of Allah. Ibn Abdul Bar radiallahu anhu, the great Hafiz al Maghrib, said, Allah began with the vadimun li nafsihi, those who oppress themselves in order for them not to despair. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not despair of the mercy of your Lord. And then he took the middle people, muqtasid, because these people are a bridge. In other words, from vadim li nafsihi, you have to move to the muqtasid. And then he ended with sabiqun bil khayrat bi idhnillah by the permission of Allah. And this is called shuhud al minna to witness the minna, to witness the gifts of Allah in your tawfiq, that Allah has given you success in being able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you be, don't become deluded and don't become arrogant and don't become self righteous and don't become filled with pride and puffed up. Because this is what shaitan wants. If he sees you in obedience, he will enter in from this direction. If he sees that he can't get you out of your obedience, he will enter in with pride. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow the heart with kibr into his jannah. Because jannah is for those who are low and humbled in the earth. Ibadu rahman al yamshuna ala ardi hawna. Those servants of the merciful. Because rahma is a, is a humbling quality. To have mercy on people is humbling. Because it's not mercy to forgive somebody that you have no ability to punish them. That's just the status quo. Right? That's just status quo. Al-Afu in the Arabic language means you have the ability to punish them and you forgive them. That's the mercy that humbles you. That's the quality that lowers you. That makes you humble. And that's the quality that enters you into Jannah. Irham man fil ard. Have mercy on those in the earth and the one in the heavens will have mercy on you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yarham ar-Rahimeen, He will have mercy on those who show mercy. Show no mercy and Allah shows no mercy. Jaza and wifaqa, because Allah gives rewards in accordance to their actions. al jaza bi jins al-amal, the reward is in, in, in accordance to the action itself. So this nafs al lawama that Allah swears by, and Allah does not swear by the nafs al amara You see, Allah doesn't swear by that first nafs. Allah swears by the second nafs because it's a great nafs. Don't think that it's not something great because Allah only swears by great things. And many Muslims are saved and die in a state of lawama that don't enter into that third stage, which is mutma'inna. And these are called ashab al yameen Ashab al yameen the people of the right, the people whose lawama, whose blaming, whose, whose, whose conscience, whose, the faculty within their own hearts enabled them to overcome their evil so that their good is greater than their evil. Their intentions that are good are stronger and better than their intentions that are evil. But this dynamic tension exists within the human heart, and this is what we, as Benny Adam, have to rise up to the level of overcoming that pull to the lower self. You see, you will not get out of this heavens and earth except with Sultan from Allah, with power and authority from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is Allah who gave us the idhn to worship Him. Remind people, give them idhn to make pilgrimage to the house. And this is the Adamic journey. This is the journey of the human being is to Rabbul Ka'ba, to the, the Lord of the house. This is where we are going. And to your Lord is your end. To your Lord is the goal. So this is the goal of the Bani Adam. Now, the, the lawama stage which Allah swears by. Allah swears by nafs al-lawama. The movement out of this stage into nafs al-mutma'inna is the highest uh, uh, movement of the human soul because this is entering into a state of absolute submission prior to this nafs al lawama the human being as long as if they're in nafs al amara they're in rebellion they're in rebellion to allah if they're in nafs al lawama they move from rebellion to obedience they move from rebellion to obedience but nafs al mutma'inna is when the heart has become tranquil now how do we do this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'innu al qulub isn't it by the dhikr of Allah that the heart becomes tranquil? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the munafiquna, لا يذكرون الله إلا قليلا 
They only make mention of Allah a little bit. Allah says, وَلَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا You have in the messenger the best example for who? The one who desires Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who desires the last day. They're looking forward to their meeting with their Lord. Man ahabba liqa Allah, ahabba Allahu liqa'ahu. The one who loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet him. Wa dhakar Allah kathira. And he makes remembrance of Allah much. That if you make remembrance of Allah much, then Allah will give you the ability to smash the hold by which shaitan has over you. And you become hurrun lillah. You become free to creation because you're abdun lillah. So you are free. And this is one of the secrets of the Arabic language in which Mawla is the freed slave and the slave. The Mawla is the freed slave, the master and the slave. Allah is our Mawla and we are also the Mawla. And this is one of the secrets of Ubudiyah to Allah, the slavehood to Allah for Bani Adam is that you become free to creation. That you no, no longer are a slave to creation. Ta'isan li abd dinar wa abd dirham wa abd al-qamisa. How wretched is the slave of the, his clothes and of wealth and of all these outward trappings of the world, which are the trap of shaitan, masyadatu shaitan. This is the snare of shaitan, to delude you into thinking that the world is permanent, to delude you into thinking that you are not made for the other world. We are ukhrawi people. We are not dunyawi people. Like Suleiman Yang say, the dunyaist, the dunyaist, the worldly people, the materialists. We are not those people. We are the people that were created for akhirah. And these, this is the sa'adatain. وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ سُعِدُوا فَفِي الْجَنَّةِ And as for those who had true happiness, it is in Jannah. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ If you, if you, once you are completely exhausted, then to your Lord. Once you are complete, this is nafs al-ammara, you see. <laughs> The child, Nafs al Amara. The Prophet said, uh, Now, one of the amazing things about the human being, looking at the insan, is that the human being is in a deep sleep. Now, this is also, there's an element of rahmah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but there's also a dangerous element because sleep is a rahmah. And Allah says, Wa min ayatihi manamakum bil wa nahar. From his signs, from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your sleep by day, by night, and by day. Now, one of the interesting things about the Arabic language is they have something called at, which is a conjunctive participle. And what the conjunction does is that the Arabs don't need to repeat certain uh, prepositions when, when it's the, they're talking about the same thing. So, for instance, in that ayah, Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ مَنَامُكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ And then he doesn't say, وَبِنْ نَهَارِ because this would indicate uh, two. This would indicate two types of sleep, but this is only one type of sleep. From his signs that we are asleep during the day and the night, and it's the same sleep. It's a continuous sleep. And like Sayyidina Ali said, "An nasu niyam fa idha matu intibahu." People are asleep, and when they die, they wake up. Now, the one who leaves the deluded state, the infantile state of believing that they're immortal, which is the dream state. And if you look at the word in Arabic for intellect, it's hilm, which is from halam, which means to dream. And the, the, the most powerful aspect of the intellect is the khayal, which is the imagination. And the khayal is from khayr, khuyala, which is arrogance and pride. And the arrogance and the pride of the, of the son of Adam is to believe that they will not die and be raised up and be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will not die, be raised up, and be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To enter into the state of adulthood, which is the age of taklif, is called ihtilam, sinnul ihtilam, which is where you enter into, puber into puberty. The ihtilam is once you internalize that first form of the verb, which is to dream. In other words, you become aware of the dreamlike nature of the world. And in no way am I uh, like the Hindus, that this is Maya, it's an illusion. We don't, we're not Hindus. We don't believe that the world is an illusion. The world is very real, but it's contingently real. It's not absolutely real. Allah is the absolutely real. This world is contingently real. It's only real as long as Allah sustains it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to annihilate it, kullu shayin halikun illa wajha. 
everything is in annihilation except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, it's going to be destroyed. Everything is uh, in annihilation and what remains is your Lord, the possessor of beauty and majesty, the possessor of jalal and ikram. And so the human being then has to wake up. And this is the task. Now, how do we wake up? This is part of how we become human. And I, since I only have about one minute left, <laughs> uh, I think I've puts forward just some uh, things for all of us to think about. But I would say that, uh, and I'll end it inshallah with this, uh, these words from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah says, Inna insana khuriqa halu'a. The human being was created in a state of anxiety. See, the child is an anxious creature. Look at the infant. They're anxious. They're anxious about their food because they don't ever believe it's going to come again. They don't. And, that, and that's why they scream. They literally shout and scream out because they haven't learned yet to trust the caregiver. But as they move into trust, they don't scream for their food anymore. They just tell their mother, I'm hungry. But initially they, Wah! and the mother has to go. Why? Because it's, it's frightened. It feels hungry and it doesn't know if there's going to be food. This is the infantile nafs. And this is the nafs of the vast majority of human beings. They're screaming because they're afraid that their provision won't come to them. So the human being is created in anxiety. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا مَسْهُ شَرُّ جَزُوعًا When evil afflicts him, when majesty afflicts him, he's jazu'a, ya'us, he goes into despair. But not the muwahid. This is the state of the infantile nafs. They go into despair. They think it's the end of the world. وَإِذَا مَسْهُ خَيْرُ مَنُوعًا And when good touches them, when good comes to them, they become withholding. Why? Because they're anxious. They're halua. They don't think, I have to hold on to it. If I let go, then I'm going to lose it all. Now, this is called the mustathna minhu in the grammar. This is the group. This is a group. Inna linsana khuliqa halua. Ida masuhu sharru jazua. Wa ida masuhu khayru manua. Illa. Except. Except men. Illa al musallin. Except those who pray. Except those who pray. Now, part of our problem as Bani Adam is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Those who are forgetful about their prayer. They're, they, they're people of prayer, but they forget their prayer. إِذَا قَامُوا إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ قَامُوا كُسَالًا لَا يَذْكُرْ يُرَاءُونَ الناس. When they get up to pray, they pray lazy. They pray lazy. And the Prophet sought refuge from laziness. أعوذ بالله من العجز والكسل. I seek refuge in Allah from incapacitation and laziness. Incapacitation is when you want to do uh, when you want to do something but don't have the strength to do it. Laziness is when you have the strength to do it but you don't want to do it. والعياذ بالله. And Allah says about these people: وإذا قاموا إلى الصلاة قاموا كسالة. When they get up to pray, they get up lazy. They don't really want to pray. Adi ibn Hatim al Ta'i said, I never heard the Adhan except I was yearning for prayer. I never heard the Adhan except I was learn, uh, yearning for prayer. The way to our humanity, if we want to leave this infantile state of anxiety and enter into a state of peace, the way is prayer. And this is why prayer is Imadu Deen, it's the pillar of the Deen. And as an Ummah, we have to go back to establishing prayer in our communities. We have to get up for Fajr. You see, the Muslims have to get up for Fajr. This is called mind over mattress. You see, you have to get up for Fajr. And I'll give you a good mechanism for not missing your Fajr. The first thing you do is recognize that Shaitan takes Bani Adam as a toilet bowl. And the toilet bowl is your ear. It even looks like a toilet bowl from one point of view. Now, Shaitan, the person who doesn't wake up for Fajr, Shaitan urinates in his ear. That's what he does. A'udhu billah. Don't laugh. Wallahi, don't laugh. <sighs> how many times in here, and you ask yourselves, how many times has shaitan taken you as a, as a toilet? How many times in your life so far? Because the Prophet only missed the prayer Fajr, we know, twice for tashri'ah, to show his ummah. This is from our usul. Sometimes the Prophet will do something 
just to explain it to the people. You see, and it's actually qurba for him. It's, it's drawing near to Allah. So how many times has shaitan taken your ear as a toilet bowl? Now the next thing to remember on the Isra and the Mi'raj, the Prophet ﷺ saw a group of people who had their heads smashed up against a rock. And then their skulls would come back together and they would be smashed again by shayateen. And he said, Ya Jibreel, who are these? And he said, Kanu yatathaqaduna an al-fajr. Those were the people that didn't really care about getting up for fajr. So we have to become people of fajr. And that's the first victory against shaitan of the day. If you haven't won that victory, you've lost the battle already. Forget about the rest of the day. Because the Prophet said, you'll wake up lazy, kasul, wa khabithun nafs, and foul in your nature. So forget the rest of the day. If you lose that first battle, shaitan's got you. Forget the rest of the day. Which doesn't mean, you know, no, make toba, Because inshallah, Allah accept your toba. And we have to establish our prayers on the time and become jama'at. Because the prayer in jama'ah is extremely important. So if we want to learn humanity, uns, uns, insan is from uns. And uns is with Allah. And our uns with Allah, our intimacy with Allah is in prayer. It's called munajat, intimate discourse with Allah. And our prayer should be together with other insan, with other bani adam, with other nas. And finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ nas." Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of nas of humankind, Malikin Nas, the king, Ilahin Nas, Min Sharri Waswas Rahan Nas, Aladi Waswi Sufi Sodori Nas, Min Al Dinati Wan Nas. If you want to enter into a state of humanity, you have to reject your shaitan. You have to reject your shaitan. And the way to reject your shaitan is to seek refuge in Rabbin Nas, Malikin Nas, Ilahin Nas. Rabbin Nas, Malikin Nas, the Marikiyomidin and the Ilah who is beyond any attribute.